Walk more glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Respected Ragi Sachin, Jay Gutchin, and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Up to this point, we've talked about, in our series of Lust and Love, passions and virtues, and specifically when it comes to virtues, how to cultivate virtues. And we mentioned, we mentioned three ways. The first way was to follow the Ten Commandments. The second way was to follow the teachings in the Scripture and the Gospel. And in the third way, we said to imitate or to copy, if possible, the lives of the saints, especially the ones who have struggled with lust. And so for the next few weeks, we'll be focusing on some, of, some saints who have struggled with this passion and who have overcome it. We'll look at their struggle We'll look at what they did, how they overcame it, what we can take from their lives to help us fight lust in our lives, and look, look at their lives, something to take away kind of as a remedy. And today we'll be focusing on a well-known saint, Saint Mary of Egypt. She may be familiar to some of you, but for those who aren't familiar with her, she is a saint who struggled with lust, was overcome with it, and was able to come out of it, fight it, and live for Christ. And she herself tells this story. She says, it's a beautiful story. From the young age of 12, she started to engage in lustful actions from her, from her youth. And for the next 17 years of her life, that's what she did. She spent her time on the streets and she spent her time sleeping with different people. And she even set herself this lifestyle choice it wasn't for money, it wasn't for any status or worldly gain. It was simply because that's what she wanted to do. That was what her desire was. That's how she wanted to use her love, to use her life, to use her body. And so that's what she did. And so after living like this for a while, one day she saw a group of people taking a trip to Jerusalem. They were going to Jerusalem, they were going to the church to celebrate the feast of the exaltation of the cross. And she thought, well, you know, it looks kind of cool. I'll go with them. And even on this trip, she was still engaging in lustful behavior. She even said herself that in order to pay for the trip and to pay for the food, she'll use her body. So eventually, they get to Jerusalem, and everyone starts to head towards the church. They're walking towards the church. Everyone's coming in, getting ready for the feast day to celebrate the exaltation of the cross. And Mary sees them and decides to go with them. And as she tries to enter the church, she finds that she can't. She's trying to walk in, but she's, she literally cannot come in. There's a force holding her back or preventing her from walking through the doors. And while this was happening, while she repeatedly tried to go in, she was noticing the people next to her were walking in with no problem. And so she started to think, what's the difference here? Why can't I go in like everyone else? And in that moment, she realized it was because of the way she was living her life. Because of the lust that she was in and the passion that she was succumbing to, the filth that she was in, she was unable to enter the church. And in this moment, in this moment of realization of her sinfulness, she looked and she saw an icon right there. She was at the church. There was an icon outside of the Teotokos. And immediately, she began to pray to this icon, asking for mercy, for forgiveness, that Christ would forgive her. And she even made a promise to abandon her way of life if she would simply be able to enter the church. And so after she, made, she asked for forgiveness and she made this promise, she walked towards the doors again, and this time she was able to come in. And as she went in, she went to the cross she prayed and she asked for help to be delivered from this passion. And the Theotokos kind of gave her a vision and told her to cross the Jordan River and go into the desert. And immediately that's what she did. She crossed the Jordan. She got baptized. She went to a church and she received her Eucharist, the, the Holy Eucharist, for the first time. And then she began her journey in the desert. And she then lived there for 48 years in the heat, in the cold, struggling with her desires, with her feelings, with her passions, with uh, lack of food, lack of clothing, 
And she endured for 48 years in the desert. And one day a priest named Zosimus comes and he finds her. He's on his own spiritual journey. But he finds her and he's amazed. At first he's not sure who she is because she's been blackened by the sun. She thinks, he thinks either she's a demon or an angel or, a, or a, just an illusion. He's not sure what to make of it. And when he realizes it's a woman, he gives her, her cloak, his cloak because she was naked. And he starts to ask her questions. And that's what she starts to tell him. She starts to tell him her story. And it's clear by this point, at least to Zosimus, that Mary was, was a very saintly woman. She, in the desert, in her struggle, in her time there, she was able to achieve spiritual feats through prayer and through, and through her fasting, through her austerity. And she was honest about her hardship. She was honest about how difficult it was, how much she struggled. And eventually, after their conversation, she asks the priest, Zosimus, to come back in one year and to give her Holy Communion. And although he was hesitant because he found a saintly person, he didn't want to leave her, he agreed, and he left. One year later, he comes back and he gives her Holy Communion. In fact, in order for her to get to him, she walked across the Jordan River, which is even more of a testament to her saintliness. And when she received the communion, she prayed, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And again, this is how the story ends. She sends Osimus away and told him to come back again in a year. And when he comes back in a year, he finds that she has passed. And he mournfully, with tears, digs a grave in the desert, buries her, returns to the world, and shares her story. And the beauty of the story is, is twofold. First, we see a person, a sinner, who has turned their life to Christ. And second, we don't just hear about her turning her life to Christ. We actually are able to see the difficulty that she went through to achieve it. We talk about trying to come closer to Christ, our spiritual journey. It took her 48 years in the desert to achieve that. But I, there's a lot of things to take away from her story, but I want us to focus on just one moment, specifically the moment when she realized her sin and turned to the icon of the Theotokos. Again, when she got to the doors of the church for the first time in her life, she did not get what she desired. Up to that point, her passion of lust controlled her and anything she desired, she got. Anything she wanted to do, she was able to. But in this moment, she wanted to enter the church. She wanted to walk through the doors. She desired to see the cross. But she was denied. And as soon as she realized what happened because of that denial, she turned to the icon of the Theotokos. In her sinful state, in her filth, she prayed. The first thing she did was she prayed. She noticed her surroundings. She was in a church. She saw an icon. And then when she was able to get into the church, she went to the cross. She saw the priest, she saw the congregation, she heard the hymns. She surrounded herself in that moment with God who would help her in this journey, who would forgive her and help her in this journey. And whenever we are working towards Christ, that surrounding is very important. The things we surround ourselves with is very important. As we see in her story, she didn't just say, oh, I'm going to follow Christ and go and continue her life. She surrounded herself with everything there. Then she went to the church, got baptized, received her Eucharist, and she went to the desert, surrounded herself with the struggle, the spiritual struggle. And we actually do this in our lives, in our daily lives, depending on what it is. For example, if we work out, if we know anyone that works out, what do they do, right? The first thing they do, they get their workout clothes, they get their workout shoes, they get maybe a pre-workout or a drink. They get their headphones, the right music, it's important. Then they go to the gym or they go to an environment where they can work, work out. Maybe it's the gym, maybe it's a place in their house. They set aside a spot to do all that. And they do this because they know if they prepare Properly, right? If they have the right clothes on, gloves, when they're lifting weights so they don't get anything on their hands, calluses, 
when they prepare themselves in that way, they know that their workout will be more beneficial. Same thing happens when we're at work. When we go to work, or when we work from home, we set up an office with a computer, with papers, with different things to help us with school, our homework, our laptops, iPads, iPhones, maybe a bulletin to tell us what to do, when things are due. Maybe even if we're in the kitchen, we have the recipe, we have the ingredients. We properly prepare, we, set the, we could turn the oven on. We properly prepare our surrounding to be able to do the task that we need to do. And in the story, it's no different for St. Mary. In order to advent, take herself out of the passion of lust, in order to fight it, she surrounded herself with an environment that was conducive to that, that would help with that. After she realized her mistake, she turned to the icon. She turned to prayer. She came into the church. She turned to the cross. She turned to the priest. And then she turned to the desert. And that surrounding is what helped her throughout her struggle. It aided her daily struggle with desire and with the things of the world, with her passion of lust. So how is this a remedy for us? How is this something we can use in our lives? What can we take from her life? How do we surround ourselves with those holy things? In her journey, she surrounded herself with, with, whole, with a holy environment, with pure things. How do we continue to do that? Every Sunday we say, holy things for the holy and pure. But how do we maintain that holiness and that purity throughout our week? Well, our week begins on Sunday and we're here at church. We receive Kurbana. That's a good start. But how do we continue that throughout the rest of the week? And if we look to the church, we see the resources that it gives us. We can turn to St. Mary's first example, the icon. Right? We put icons in our car. Maybe we can put icons in our houses. Maybe if we're, especially if we're struggling with lust, we can change the wallpaper of our phones or our iPads or our laptops to an icon of Christ or someone to kind of keep our attention on Christ at all times. Maybe an icon on our desk at work or in the living room anywhere where we can maintain our focus. And the next thing she did was she turned to prayer. Surrounding ourselves with the prayers of the church every day and consistently even family prayer. Reading scripture, it said in her story that when she left, she, was, she wasn't that educated. She wasn't smart, she couldn't read, she didn't know the Bible well, she didn't know the Christian faith well. But in the desert, through her austerity, through her sanctity, when Zosimus came and spoke to Mary of Egypt, he saw that she knew the Bible. And so for us, we can surround ourselves with the scriptures, with daily reading, with daily meditation, right? Even in our houses right now, I'm sure we have a picture of Christ and a Bible verse somewhere on the wall or in our room. It's things like that, surrounding ourselves and remembering, not just for decoration, but also to live in. Uh, other ways we can surround ourselves is following the weekly fasts, Wednesdays and Fridays. And maybe even listening to the hymns of the church or to Orthodox podcast teaching, teachings of the church on our way to work, on our way to school, in our free time. Kind of taking ourselves away from social media or from music or from TV and replacing it with what, this, what the church has to offer, with things that are related to the church. It's this act of surrounding ourselves with the church when we're not in church. That's what we can take away from our story. In other words, taking church home with us after we leave today. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we have tools, very powerful tools in the church, prayer and fasting. I'm sure we've heard that over and over again. And it's true, it can help us so much if we adequately do it. But there are other tiny things that we can do to fight the passion of lust and to fight on this spiritual journey. So when we go home today, Let's look at ourselves, let's look at our surroundings. What are we doing, what are we watching, what are we listening to? Or who are we surrounding ourselves with that's keeping us on this path of lust or, or in, stuck in this passion? And what can we change around us in order to work back towards Christ? Maybe it's buying that icon, maybe it's spending a little bit more time in prayer. 
Maybe it's listening to the hymns, practicing the hymns, singing to ourselves, saying the Jesus prayer. And let's see what we can change so that we too can become holy and pure, just as St. Mary of Egypt did in her life, just as she was able to accomplish. And keep in mind, it took 48 years. It wasn't something she did overnight. Holy things for the holy and pure should not be something we simply say every Qurbana, every holy Qurbana. But it should be something that we try to live and that we try to take home with us and implement in our families as we continue on the spiritual path and try to come out of this passion of lust, even to the smallest degree. All for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen.